Yes, sir. All right, so uh, this is uh, our, the ninth season of the Friday night readings uh, at Westminster. Uh, it was uh, just a kind of brainchild of mine and a few other people uh, in the beginning when we opened this building and it's grown into something really, really fun, I think, and, and nice. And I know I involve my classes and other English teachers involve their classes too. So the next, uh, we have others coming up. In January, the novelist Dan Pope will be here. He lives in West Hartford and actually sets his novels in West Hartford. So there's a lot of kind of uh, interesting things going on for us to, to take a look at, especially for day students. Uh, and then in uh, February, we have the poet and memoirist Joy Layton will be here. Our Westminster poet this year is the Connecticut State Poet Laureate, uh, Reddy McWilkin. He'll be here in mid-April. And then the novelist, Emily St. John Mandel, uh, one of my favorite uh, uh, young uh, novelists in the country, will be here at the end of April. And then we have a kind of surprise, fun singer-songwriter event in May that involves an alum of the school and his daughter who is trying to make it as a singer-songwriter. Uh, so it's going to be a lot of fun uh, that way. And the only other thing I want to say is the, these, uh, uh, these events cost money. Uh, and it take a lot of planning. We need a lot of support. And we've been very fortunate to have good support in these, uh, actually the last 20 years with the Westminster Poet and the last uh, uh, nine years with the Friday nights at Westminster. Uh, some of that, uh, a good part of that funding has come from the Ford Goldfarb English Department Enrichment Fund. Very generous gifts from Maureen Ford and, and her daughter, Kirsten Ford Goldfarb, uh, class of, I think, 2001. Uh, and that is, that's kept us going, but this fall has been very good. We, we have received recently a number of other gifts, and I just want to thank one other uh, uh, family tonight, and that's the Petrina family. Joe Petrina is the sixth former here at Westminster. Uh, his uh, sister graduated a couple of years ago, Jolene, and uh, Joe and Laura Petrina, the parents, have uh, given a nice donation in support of the Friday Nights at Westminster program. Uh, I think in honor of their children and the good experiences their children had here uh, in English classes and just in general. So it's a really nice thing that we have this kind of support that lets us bring main brand poets to our school. Uh, so that's all I'm going to say. Uh, Mr. Stevens is going to introduce the student reader for tonight and then I'll say a few words about our guest reader and then we'll get going. There, uh, there are refreshments afterwards down in the Baxter Art Gallery, uh, so be sure to come there. It's a holiday-themed professional night. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Griffiths, and uh, welcome, everybody. Before I introduce our student reader, who plays the role of undercard to use the lexicon of preliminary boxing matches on big fight nights, I want to provide some context for how Ian, Dar Ian Dardney a well-respected Westminster Scholar athlete earned the opportunity to be tonight's student reader. As many of you know, the Sixth Form spends its first two weeks of the fall focusing on good writing. That focus includes studying the readings of Naomi Shihab Nye, Brian Doyle, and Scott Russell Saunders, who all are wonderful writers and approach their respective craft in many inspiring ways. During this unit, our Sixth Formers do a fair amount of their own writing, in addition to participating in a form-wide This I Believe writing contest. The This I Believe writing concept is, is not unique to Westminster, but rather was an idea begun in the 1950s and then revived again by National Public Radio in 2004. At its core, the idea is to travel around the country and invite Americans from all walks of life to write about a core belief that guides their daily lives. But this, I believe, responses can be no longer than 500 words and are typically manifested in some sort of personal story or anecdote. It's a challenging and provocative assignment for our sixth form because it forces them to reflect upon their many beliefs, choose one, and then put those convictions into words. As you might also imagine, Westminster English teachers thoroughly enjoy reading these pieces and learn to understand their students even better. All 114 students from the forum wrote an essay. Each of the seven classes nominated at least one essay, and then the anonymous judges chose the top three from that group. 
Honorable mentions went to both Natalie Wilson and Sophia Gasser, who each wrote a unique and thoughtful response. Ian Dartney, tonight's undercard and the 2017 This I Believe winner, has crafted a subtle, amusing, and clever piece that offers more than a few truths that inevitably will resonate with all Westminster students. Please join me in welcoming Ian. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. What's up? <laughs> Hi, Mom. I uh, titled my This I Believe essay, This I Believe. <laughs> there's something about toaster buses. Or maybe there's nothing about them, but that's what makes something about them. Before I came to Westy, I didn't even know what toasters were. The first time I heard the word toaster, I thought it was a reference to how hot the bus was going to be. But here at school, those short buses that kindergartners ride to school are known as toasters. And here I am, 18 years old, getting ready to play college sports in a year, still riding toasters around like I'm in the magic school bus. <laughs> and I kind of love it. It's funny, leaving the state-of-the-art locker room and hopping aboard the toaster. It humbles you. Sometimes Westie's facilities can trick you. They can make you feel more important than you truly are. More deserving than you truly are. Better than you truly are. Not the toaster, though. <laughs> the toaster reminds you what's important. The game itself. Toasters are very small and the seats are too close together, and they aren't comfortable, and there's never enough room. The toaster only has two temperatures, too hot or too cold. <laughs> Often, toasters forget to slow down for speed bumps and send you hovering above your seat. Or sometimes, they accelerate through a turn they should have braked for, and you get crushed between your buddy and the window. There's not enough seats to sit alone. You will be sitting next to somebody. And by the way, the seat isn't big enough to fit two fully grown high school boys. You will be squished. After 20 minutes on the toaster, your butt will fall asleep. And within 45 minutes, you'll be more excited to get off the bus than you are for the actual game. But that's what makes them so great. It's 12 of your closest friends riding in a bus that's way too small for them. It quite literally brings people together. As a new student, I had my first third soccer game at Salisbury. It's only about an hour ride there, but with a full bladder, it felt like three. Of course, no bathrooms on the toaster. So, I had to go the old-fashioned way. I asked around for a Gatorade bottle <laughs> until a kid named Dan gave me one. There I was, kneeling on the seat, relieving myself in front of 12 strangers. <laughs> Obviously, a bit of a weird scene. But the boys seemed to find it amusing. Maybe they respected the boldness of the maneuver, or maybe they just had empathy for the kid who had to pee that bad. Either way, it was a good icebreaker. <laughs> and by the end of the trip, I felt like I had some new buddies. And now that kid, Dan, is my roommate. That's what's so great about the toaster. It naturally builds camaraderie and character. The boys are talking, laughing, bumping music that's two notches too loud, getting ready for the game with each other. And after the game, win or lose, you still ride back together in that little toaster. It's humbling, yet beautiful. And even if it has no bathroom, I wouldn't trade it for any other bus.
<laughs> Thank you, Ian. Uh, it's my season to coach, and we have a lot of away matches, and I'll be driving those toasters. Uh, but apparently, that's a better experience than driving them. Uh, a little over a year ago, I got an email out of the blue from Dan Keating, a Westminster alum, class of 1989. Dan had been a student of mine in senior English in my third year of teaching at Westminster. Guessing that I might be involved in some way with the visiting writers programs here, uh, uh, Dan was writing to tell me about a writer he thought would be good for one of our visiting writers programs, a friend of his from college about whom he raved. He's a great guy, a terrific teacher, and on the short list of the smartest people I know, wrote Dan. That friend from the College of the Holy Cross is the poet Philip Metris our guest writer tonight. I quickly got up to speed about Mr. Metris by reading several of his books, and almost as quickly, I invited him to be a Friday night reader this year, especially after my friend, the poet Naomi Shiab Nye, told me I would be a fool not to invite him. Philip Metris is the kind of poet whose imagination knows no bounds. He is interested in everything and anything. And he particularly loves writing about how global themes are often reflected in the details of ordinary life, which, of course, is what all great poetry does. My students and I have read essays and poems by Mr. Metris that ask us to consider the virtues of the lost art of memorizing poems by heart, to realize that questions are far more important than answers, to look at ancient objects of art with new eyes, to investigate the complicated roots of today's scary international conflicts, to visit and ruminate about the new Russia, to reflect on the mysteries of language and love, and to embrace the perspectives of other people who are different from us. It's true, his poems are not always easy to grasp. He asks his readers to work hard, to read between the lines, to investigate allusions, to decode complicated syntax. But the rewards for doing that hard work are absolutely amazing. Emily Dickinson said in one of her letters, if I read a book and it makes my whole body so cold, no fire can ever warm it, I know that is poetry. If I feel physically as if the top of my head were taken off, I know that is poetry. And that's exactly how I feel when I read poems by Philip Metris. Please welcome our featured reader tonight, mm -hmm. Philip Metris. After an introduction like that, I always feel like I should be able to levitate or something. <laughs> <laughs> Speak in tongues. Uh, thank you so much, Michael, for the invitation to read here. Um, thanks to Ian for his funny and poignant and somewhat graphic uh, <laughs> story, which I loved. Um, thanks to all of you for being here. And uh, it's just, I always get nervous before I read because uh, I know, like, I'm trying to sell poetry to people who think poetry is hard and that it's not necessarily connecting to their lives. And I suppose what I hope by the end of this talk, you'll feel. Maybe there's a way in for you. So let's see what happens, all right? Yep. All right. And if you get bored, just like close your eyes and go like this. Like, so I know that you're really bored. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Some of you may have read uh, this anecdote in, uh, in by heart, but I'd just like to share it again because um, I actually got lost in the woods running today, and I thought this would be a perfect time to sort of re rehash that moment. So, uh, not too long ago, I was in an airport. It was O'Hare Airport in Chicago. It's a tremendously busy airport, and as an introvert, I don't like crowds. My daughter, on the loves crowds. She, she sees a group of people and just gets all excited, and I just want to disappear. Um, so I was reading a book and trying to mind my own business um, at the gate, waiting for my flight home, and a guy sat down right across from me and looked at me strange, and I thought, well, that's odd. Like, so I, I went back to my book, and he sort of leaned in a little bit further, and I looked at him, and he did look a little familiar. He looked like a, a thicker version, maybe, of someone that 
that I had taught. And he said, do you teach at John Carroll University? And I said, yeah, I do. Um, are you Dr. Metris? I said, yeah, yeah. And uh, they call us doctor. And it's very strange. I can't heal anyone, but um, he said, I still remember the poem. And in the middle of the airport, he stood up and started to recite a poem. Stopping by woods on a snowy evening. Have you heard that one? Yeah. By Robert Frost. Yeah. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near, between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there's some mistake. The only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep, and miles to go before I sleep. And I was so touched, you know, like 10 years later, he still remembered this poem that I made him memorize, which he probably hated me for, you know, 10 years before, but he kept it with him by heart, in his heart. It meant something to him. I said, what are you up to these days? He says, I'm an actuary. I said, what is an actuary? And apparently he uh, uses uh, mathematical models to try to predict the future. But he didn't really want to talk about that. He really wanted to talk about this poem and how much it meant to him. And so that's one of the things that I hope that happens to you, that you find a poem that speaks to you so strongly that you kind of want to memorize it, that you want to keep it with you, because it reminds you of something. So I thought a little bit further, and I didn't write this in the essay, but why did it touch him, and why do people still teach it? Even though Frost is considered, you know, sort of a grumpy old New Englander from a hundred years ago, what does he have to say to us, right? Um, that poem to me is all about something that each of you may be going through in your own life, right? It's about someone who tries to step away from the busyness of their existence and just stays in this place, which is a weird place and a dark place. The darkest evening of the year is coming up, right? Just yeah. in a couple of weeks. Even as Horace thinks it's odd, uses the word queer, um, that, that they've stopped there. What is he doing there exactly? Why is he there? He's stepping away from his life. Some have thought that, some have made arguments that this is a dark moment in this guy's life, that he wants to end his life. Others have seen it as a retreat from existence. But what I feel so strongly about it is someone who feels alone and is alone in that moment and yet, for some reason, finds a way to return to his life. There's something about the surroundings that he is experiencing make, that makes him ready to return. We don't actually even know. Um, and so he goes back. And what I loved about that poem, when I read it when I was about your age, and what I loved about other poems like T.S. Eliot's The Love Song of Geoffrey Prufrock, has anybody read that before? It's about it. It's about a guy who's sort of stuck in his head and has a chaos of thoughts and is afraid to act in the world. And when I read that poem, I thought, how does Eliot know exactly what I'm thinking? <laughs> how does Eliot know what it's like to be me? To be afraid of doing something wrong and to have this roil in my brain of all the thoughts, passions, desires that I have, that I ha had when I was your age and still have, although slightly blunted, thank goodness. It would be impossible to live as a teenager your whole life. It just wouldn't work. So you're in the middle of the, the great chemistry of, of human existence. If you feel that, if you feel high highs and low lows, guess what? That's totally normal. Reading poetry to me and then writing it made me feel that I wasn't alone. That I, like that guy in the Robert Frost poem, um, had to confront my own self and could, within my own self, kind of move back into my life. So one of the things that poetry does is, and, and literature does in general, right, is that you read it and you go, oh yeah, it's not just me who's felt this before. That there's a solidarity in the struggle of being human for each of you. Um, that you're having, maybe right now, right, like trying to figure out your life, wondering what, you know, who's your friend, 
um, what you want to do, where you want to go next. Um, that's all in the literature. Over and over again we see that. So, I hope that through the course of your reading that you find some people who speak to you. And if they don't speak to you, I hope that you write your own story. I hope that you listen to the voice inside yourself to do that. So that's my, um, my claim that literature has something to do with your actual life and that reading it will help you recognize that you are not alone, no matter what it is that you're going through, and that others have gone through the exact same thing, and that you can look at literature not only to find ways of living, but just ways of surviving your own experience. All right, so without uh, further ado, I asked three student readers to come help me read a poem from Sand Opera. Because I'm illiterate, I can't read. <laughs> Okay, this is a poem called Cell Phone. You are wanted. You are not alone. You are wanted. You are not alone. Someone needs me to answer now. Someone needs to answer me now. Someone needs me to answer now. Watch. I watch. I wait for you. I will never be wanted. So um, I'll move back and forth between these, uh, these voices. 
This is the authoritative voice. A man named Atala from Morjan traced his roots back to the Gasasana, those who'd come from Mesopotamia to Lebanon. Eight years old, new to the neighborhood, I pedaled past a pack of kids, their stare. Spick, hey Spick! First one, then a hail of crab apples pelting my back. Because of his bravery in wars against the Shiites, the Amir called him Abu Arjali, father of men. On a carnival cruise, my father once dressed as a sheikh, as if to unlock what was coiled in cells, buried under tongues. All junior high, I blow-dried the revolt of curls. From that day forth, he was Abu Arjali. With print standardization, the name became Abu Arjali. In England, I was French. In France, I was Moroccan. In Russia, I was, I was Chechen. In Greece, they read my olive skin as theirs. Could not believe when I couldn't understand. At Ellis Island, when Skandar ibn Mitri Abergeli was asked, it was written, Skandar Metris. But at the port near Ephesus, the scrum of drivers and pickpockets surrounded us, strictly business. Among ruins of houses, a boy who could pass for my child pressed an old coin into my hand, asking for nothing but its value in American. My cousin, forgive me, I was struck dumb, foreigner to my own lips. Like yesterday, a Friday, the sun down, a man in black coat and bowler hat stopped me in the street. Son, it's time for shul. Why do you walk home? This is about misrecognition. I live in an almost entirely Jewish Orthodox neighborhood, and shul is temple, is synagogue. And um, what I sort of loved about that moment was, despite the fact that I am Arab American, this guy looked at me, saw I looked different, and was like, oh, it must be one of the, the Jewish brothers. So he's like, hey, why are you going this way? It's, the temple's that way. Um, there's something kind of amazing and strange about being misrecognized and to be invited into various communities. And, and this, that poem was sort of about how, I got this story about how strong and cool our family was. And basically I felt like, like everybody else, like a kid who wanted to hide from, from that legacy. Um, and I only wish now I had curls, right? I mean, <laughs> like, the hair is not the way it used to be, so <laughs> life is tough. Enjoy your hair now, because you want to be The older people laugh. You guys have no idea. Um, you know, it's funny. I was thinking literally today. I had this thought. Do you ever do this where you have a thought and you're like, wow, like, that's, a, that's a thought. Like, I want to hold on. I want to keep that thought. Um, and I realized probably the strange thing is I probably had that thought before. And the thought was that... Um, one of the things that always attracted me um, about Iraq, what I think now is that, you know, our people are from Iraq. And uh, I didn't think about it until I was reading that poem again. Thinking, oh yeah, of course the story is our people, and probably lots of you people, came from the Mesopotamia, but you know, it's been so long that you don't know. Um, so I uh, got involved in an um, in activist movement to help Iraqi people during the 1990s. It was a huge economic sanctions campaign basically that basically starved people there. And, uh, one of the guys that I worked with was a, a native Iraqi who was living in my little community in Bloomington. And he said, uh, I have a story to tell you. It was about a refugee that he met in uh, Amsterdam who had fled Iraq. So right now you probably know it. There's a ton of refugees right now. There's a lot of people all around the world being uh, forced out of their homes and out of their countries because of violence. And this is just one of many stories that one can tell. Um, so, one more story. He said, in a restaurant in Amsterdam, a young woman came in speaking Arabic. I said, are you Iraqi? She said, I haven't eaten for three days. I said, what do you mean? She said, I need to turn, turn myself in. This was strange language to me, a different logic. Come and sit, I said. Food brought out, she ate, finally spoke, her husband now in Istanbul. They'd escaped Iraq, he was taxi driver, sold his car, paid 5,000 to Turkish driver to send her Istanbul to Amsterdam, a big 
truck, crates of fruit and vegetables, had a tiny space in the middle, kept her there, gave her food and water supposed to last seven days, lasted four. Strange language, mouth of the truck. She was stuck in one position for seven days, could not move, crates of figs, pallets cracked, blocked, lodged. Then they just dropped her in the middle of Amsterdam. Right then, she was hoping, waiting, turned myself in, my husband not far behind. Strange language to me. I did not understand. Turned myself in, in the middle of Amsterdam. Do you speak? Speak. Suddenly got really quiet. <laughs> I, I recently learned also that my, one of my grand, great grandmothers was an illegal, an undocumented person. Uh, and uh, that just kind of blew my mind, you know? We all come from somewhere else. All of us. Unless you're Native American. And even Native Americans came across the Bering Strait, so we all came from somewhere else. Uh, this is a poem about flying while Arab. Um, so, I was on a flight, and this was right around the time that a guy tried to light his shoe uh, bomb on, on fire. And uh, there was a lot of tension in the early 2000s after the 9 11 attacks, as you can imagine. How many people have been into an airport recently? Did you have to take off your shoes? Yes. yes. That's because one idiot had the bomb his shoe, and now all of us have to take off our shoes. Thank goodness it wasn't in his underwear, right? <laughs> uh, so, uh, I was on a flight and a, a woman looked at me like I was, like was going to do something. And it, it really kind of hurt my feelings. Um, kind of made me, made me angry and then it made me sad for the way people judge people by their appearance, by their look. Um, so what did I do on the poet? I wrote a poem. <laughs> it's not a revenge. It's, a, it's an attempt to think about what it means to, to be in that space of misrecognition. And it, it ends in a Quaker meeting house. Anybody know the Quakers? Quakers are a beautiful uh, faith. Um, they just basically sit together in silence until the spirit moves them and somebody says something. Everyone can speak. Like there's no hierarchy, and um, they all they say things like "I'll hold you in the light," which is such a poetic, awesome thing to say. Like if you're hurting, they'll say, um, "I'll hold you in the light." You know, that's what you should say to your friends next time, or get a tattoo you know, if you want a tattoo. You know, "I'll hold you in the light." So, no, no tattoo fans. <laughs> okay. All right, here's the poem. On the flight overseas, the rows dotted with isolados, each an island of eyes. I was looking for, looking like. What outside is a cross, inside is a window. A white woman across the aisle eyed me the entire flight. Her gaze widened, a neck crane as I, her eyes slowly removed, her eyes, my shoes. What can I say? Sometimes I'm afraid I'm carrying a bomb. Then I'm a sleeper and don't know when I'll awaken. I should have said, identity isn't an end. It's a portal, a deportation from the country of mirrors, an inflection within a question, punctuation in the sentence of birth. I said nothing. Later, visiting a Quaker meeting, I sat among scattered chairs. On the shores of breathing, all eyes shut, I waited. Silence, our rudder. Silence, our harbor. So I want to just take us back to Guantanamo for a minute. There's an amazing book by a guy who was in Guantanamo called Guantanamo Diary. It's a, it's a memoir of a Yemeni man who, not a Yemeni man, uh, is he Martin? Yeah, Martian. A Mauritanian man who uh, basically learned English in the prison and wrote about his experience. And this book, before this book came out, this book that he wrote, I think so shamed people because of its humanity, because of its articulateness, so shamed people that he was actually finally uh, released. 
he was not guilty of um, terrorism charges. They just let him go home. And so now this guy's at home. But at the time, I read about his case. There was a legal proceeding that he submitted with his defense lawyers uh, that he had gotten tortured in the prison. And the torture involved all sorts of things. Um, not necessarily physical punishment as much as total auditory um, invasion and light. So he was, he was exposed to some kind of physical pressure treatments and stuff like that. But this is so weird, right? They had light all the time, 24-7, and constant sound being barraged at him. And uh, if you've ever been awake for two or three days, what happens? Have you ever been awake for more than a couple of days? You totally get stressed out, right? And you start to lose your marbles a little bit, right? You start to see things. You're, you're, literally, your brain starts to go pathological on you. They also played music at them. If you were going to play music to torment someone, what music would you play? Jazz. Farming. Nickelback, yes, of course. Country music. So, now, now, did they read the poem? They read it. Oh, they read it. Well, the, uh, the ingenious, master, evil masterminds of our, of our great uh, military intelligence decided that instead of just playing, you know, like, I don't know, death metal or something like that, which you'd expect. Or country, if you don't like country, I don't know. My poor daughters don't like country. Um, uh, they played, like, the uh, Barney theme song. And uh, Sesame Street theme song. And can you, so how many people know the Barney theme song? Can you sing it for me? We, there's that one, but this is the I Love You one. You know the I Love You? You love me. I love you. You love me. We're a happy family. I had two times to sing, but I hear you got some voice here, okay? Good, 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 good. All right. Can you imagine hearing that song over and over again? We drive you crazy. This is a poem from Mahamadou Ul Slahi, and it's going to connect you some of the lyrics of the songs that he heard. In the cell of Els, in the pitch white, someone's hands shackled between ankles in the nights and sunny days, keeping the clouds shaking the rib cage and no way to keep the music from entering and breaking the bodies hit, let the bodies hit. Barney is a dinosaur. This is the touching without being touched. This is the being without silence. From our imagination. In wave upon wave, in a shipping container. I love you in a box of shock. You love me in a cemented dream. We're a happy family with a great big hug and chains that leave no more. Won't you say you love me too? You're not supposed to admit this as a, as a writer and as a reader, but whenever I sing that, first of all, I feel like a total idiot singing because I have no voice, but it really brings me chills to think about how uh, all right, I want, I want to just read a couple short, hopefully not uh, painful poems for you. This is from a book about Russia, and uh, I got the chance to live in Russia for a year, many years ago. I found it a magical, strange, and slightly tormenting place. Um, we hear a lot about Russia in the news today. It's very sad to me that it's all about Putin and his autocracy. He's, he's a bad dude, of course, like lots of leaders, he's a bad guy. Um, but the Russian people were fascinating to me and, um, and lovely in, in a lot of ways and very durable, uh, amazing people. And um, I made some great friends there. And so I hope that these poems get a little bit of a sense of surrealism, humor, and humanity of Russia, as it is. Start with a joke. Uh, this is a joke I heard 
Um, Russia's, in particular in the spring, but you know, this can be quite dirty. It's hard to stay clean in Russia. You know, like springtime, like all the snows melt and there's just mud everywhere. No grass, just mud everywhere. Um, and yet, people, you know, they want to look good. So this is a joke. Cowboy with a conscience is what it's called. A cowboy was riding in the west when he came upon some Indians. His conscience said, take off your jeans. So he did. The Indians shot an arrow into both his eyes. Lying on the ground bleeding, he asked his conscience why it told him to do that. It replied, can't you see your jeans are still spotless? <laughs> This is a, a translation of a Russian poet, um, a crazy dude. From her excessive curiosity, an old woman tumbled out a window, fell and shattered. Another old woman leaned out from a window and looked below at what had shattered, but from excessive curiosity, also tumbled out, fell and shattered. Then a third old woman tumbled out a window, then a fourth, then a fifth, when the sixth old woman tumbled out, I got tired of watching them and, and went to Malts of Market, where I heard an old blind man was given a knitted shawl. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty weird, huh? <laughs> All right, one more um, from this little book. This is called Three Rushes. The only thing I need to describe is that um, Russia is a place, uh, like the United States, that has extreme wealth disparity. And after the fall of the Soviet Union, there were these folks called the New Russians who got kind of all the money and they spent ridiculously on crazy things. You guys know what a dacha is? Dacha is like a country house. Okay. Yeah, dacha. What? Awesome. Can I come over? <laughs> Hers has five floors. <laughs> it does. All right, so this, this poem is for you. Um, three rushes. God, you guys have lots of energy. I love your energy. It's so, like, Thank you. amazing. I love it. Can I have some? All right, number one, three rushes. A new Russian approached a girl and asked her to go out with them. She asked, well, do you have a two-story dacha? No, he glumly replied. She asked, do you have a Mercedes Benz? No, he didn't. Dejected, he went home and asked his old man what to do. Ah, oh, just knock a couple stories off your dacha, trade in your limousine, and you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Two, on the train, someone asks an old pensioner how things are going. I'm getting by, he replied. In the morning, I don't eat breakfast. For lunch, I drink tea with a little bread. And for dinner, I take something a little less heavy. <laughs> Three, evening was setting in, and the host offered to drive his guest home. It was a cold night, and the windshield kept icing over. Twice they almost crashed into an oncoming car, and the nervous guest advised the host to scrape off the ice. I doubt it would help, answered the driver, seeing as I forgot my glasses at home. <laughs> <laughs> So those are actually, those are literally just jokes that I found um, in, in Russia. And the last one kind of struck me because when I went there, and I, I got picked up by a, a host family I was starting to stay with at the time. We were driving and it became dark and he didn't turn on his lights. And I said, uh, why are your lights off? He said, I'm saving the battery. <laughs> and so whenever an oncoming car, who's lights were also not on, <laughs> would become approaching. They would both turn on their lights for like a half second and then turn them off to save the battery and move on to their day. And I thought I was going to die. I, I was totally afraid. He's like, life is difficult. No one has survived it yet.
Uh, I got a chance to, because my sister is an adventuresome soul, uh, attend her wedding in another country. In a country whose name you may have heard but doesn't officially exist, and that's called Palestine. You may have heard in the news that Donald Trump made a, a decision to um, basically declare the U.S. a support for moving its embassy to Jerusalem after 50 years, basically, or 50 to 70 years, basically saying that the status of Jerusalem should be resolved as a final part of the peace process. Um, so uh, the Palestinians have yet to have um, their own country, um, but what I can tell you is that the, those who I met were an amazing, beautiful people. And one of the things I learned when I was there, um, as she got married there, was the, the wonderful, beautiful flexibility of Arabic as a language, as well as the culture. And so this is just a moment from a longer poem about this experience. Scarred sisters are radiant with wide mouths and waves and teeth and singing. And though there is a great unhappiness framed in silent, unsmiling faces hammered on the insides of houses, night is lifting, the women are drumming, the tabla, their voices inviting a heart to break itself and open a space another could nest inside. Because there is a word for love in this tongue that entwines two people as one. And there is a word for love in this tongue that nests in the chambers of the heart. And a word for love in this tongue that wanders the earth. For love in this tongue in which you lose yourself in this tongue. And a word that carries sorrow within its bowels. And a word for love that exudes from your pores. And a word for love that shares its name with falling. And I hope you experience all those loves in your life. I hope that you did. I'm sure you will. Um, all right. I'm going to read this little poem that my, uh, came from something my daughter said. When you guys were younger, probably about to the age seven, you were all poets, and then something happened. The age of reason hit. Um, that's one of the really cool things, actually, about being a writer, is that you can sort of enter into a kind of mindset that's both very young and also very old, um, very ancient, actually. So she would just say this amazing stuff. I, I keep not swearing. You guys don't do swearing here, right? Okay. Only, only in class. <laughs> Hell yeah. All right, whatever. All right, so I was having a conversation with her, and she, she um, taught me something really about the word peace. I asked her, what does peace mean? And so we had this conversation. What does it mean, I say? She says, it means to be quiet just by yourself. She says, there's a treasure chest inside. You get to dig it out. Somehow it's spring. It says, will it always rain? In some countries, I say they're praying for rain. She asks, why do birds sing? In the dream, my notebook dipped in water. All the writing was lost. It says, read the story again, but which one? That which diverts the mind is poetry. It says, you know those planes that hit those buildings? Asks, why do birds sing? When the storm ends, she stops, holds her hands together, closes her eyes. What are you doing? I'm praying for the dead worms. It says, listen. So I hope that you have the opportunity to dig out the treasure chest that you have from each of you. And the way that I dig, my shovel is poetry, my shovel is, is language, my shovel is the pen. Um, as James Tony once said, I'll dig with it. I have one more thing uh, that I'd just like to share with you tonight. It's a translation from a Russian poet, um, and it has a little musical accompaniment. I'm going to play a crazy weird song by a band called Guided by Voices. None of you have heard it, and uh, none of you will hear it again, and that's okay. <laughs> um, it's called Unnamed Events, and so just think about what this is.
might be a mess in here. Everybody see? Yeah.